I am pleased to give a warm welcome and introduction to Anthony Mallison, who is the Tourism Resource Coordinator with the Invasive Species Council of BC. Anthony works with tourism owners, operators, and staff to prevent the spread of invasive species through tourism activities. Anthony spent the last three years working in the industry as a sea kayak guide and naturalist, and he has a background in, in environmental sciences from Dalhousie University. Anthony's presentation today will focus on the many connections between invasive species and the tourism industry. Tourism is a major vector of spread for invasive species. He'll review how visitors can unknowingly and sometimes on purpose introduce invasive species to new areas and look at some of the impacts of invasive species on biodiversity, the economy and the industry as a whole. The webinar is also an introduction to our new Invasive Wise Tourism Program that the Council is developing. An online resource package and training course will be released in the spring of this year to be piloted with, with partners across the province. We're really excited about this program and we're also looking for industry partners as well. I'll let Anthony talk about this further and pass the mic over to him now. I hope you all enjoy the webinar. All right, so thank you for that introduction and welcome everyone to the webinar today. So invasive species and tourism, we're gonna to be talking about our new invasive wise tourism plan. So like Sue mentioned there, the presentation is gonna focus on the connection between invasive species and the tourism industry in BC. Before we really dive in though, um, we're gonna get to some basics to start off with. So first off, we're gonna start talking about the Invasive Species Council of BC, who we are, what we do, then an important one, we're going to do a little invasive species 101 blitz. So just a quick review of invasive species, what they are, why are they important, and the, the stuff that we really need to know. Then we'll move on to beautiful BC. So we're going to talk about what makes BC so special and what draws people to visit here. And then we'll get to the, the meat of the presentation. So invasive species and tourism. This is why we're really here today. So why does this project matter? How is tourism impacted by invasive species? And equally as important, how does tourism contribute to the spread of invasives? Then we'll talk about taking action now. So what can we do right now? And what have some other people already been up to? So this tourism project we have is kind of launching this spring, but that doesn't mean that there aren't some simple steps that we can take right now to uh, prevent invasives around the province. And then we'll look at what it looks like to have an invasive wise province. So we'll take a look at the new invasive wise tourism program and some of the resources that will be coming available. So first up, a little bit about ISCBC. What are we? So we are a registered charity um, and a nonprofit society and a dynamic action-oriented organization helping to coordinate and unite a wide variety of concerned stakeholders in the struggle against invasive species in BC. We have a diverse staff of educators, researchers, and field operators representing nearly every region of BC. So we work with local, provincial and federal governments to share information, strategies, resources around invasive species control and management. <clears throat> we work closely with 13 different regional invasive species organizations. You can see the little inset map there spread all out across the province. So we jointly deliver on a diverse range of projects, special programs and on the ground activities. We also collaborate frequently with First Nations and Indigenous groups and engage with industry, volunteer organizations and other societies. We have great representation from all of these partners on the new Invasive Wise Tourism Project, including many members that work within the tourism industry. So our vision is for healthy landscapes and communities free of invasive species across BC and the country. And our mission is to take action to build healthy landscapes, habitats and communities through education and responsible practices to prevent the spread of invasives. So we're involved with many different education initiatives, including providing resources to teachers and providing informal education. We're also involved with creating training resources for resource extraction industry professionals. One of the foundations of ISCBC is our behavior change programs. So many of you may already know behavior change is a difficult process and it involves raising awareness of an issue and then providing practical actions that individuals and organizations can adopt to address that issue. We are involved with many successful local and national behavior change programs that you might already be familiar with. So you can see them listed there on the page, clean, drain, dry, plant-wise, don't let it loose, 
play clean go and burn local burn local sorry burn local burn buy local burn local our new invasive wise tours and program will be building on these in 2021 so we'll have a little look at what that's looking like so just a little timeline for the project the initial project is going to have a focus on aquatic invasive species in early 2022, we gathered a diverse group of industry professionals and scientists and put together a project advisory team. We also distributed a baseline survey to tourism and industry professionals and the results indicated that operators are highly dependent on healthy ecosystems for their livelihood. But they also indic indicated that there's a lack of access to resources and best management practices. This gave us confidence that this project was needed and we began development of our e-learning training course and a package of resources. So this spring 2021, we will be piloting the project with about 20 companies and gathering feedback on online training courses and on the resources. We're gonna take this input and aim for a full release of the program later in the year, ready for the spring of 2020, 2022. At this point, we are hoping for a broad representation from across the province and with terrestrial operators as well. The long-term goal of the project is to change attitudes and behavior of tourism operators and travel travelers in the province and keep BC healthy and natural. All right, so that was a little bit about ISCBC and some of our programming, but now let's get caught up on some other important stuff. What are invasive species? So at ISCBC, we define an invasive species as any non-native organism that can cause economic or environmental harm and can spread quickly to new areas of BC. So if we break it down a bit further, invasives are first off non-native. So they're not naturally occurring in this area. Good example there is a red-eared slider turtle. These are common as pets and people seem to get tired of them, introduce them to the environment where they can easily transmit diseases to native turtles and are actually known carriers of salmonella. So invasives also have the ability to quickly establish and spread. So for example, plants like Canada thistle, you can see in the photo there, have seeds which are designed to spread easily in the wind and they can establish in different areas very quickly. Invasives also outcompete native species. So we have a photograph there of English ivy, which grows to form dense monocultures that overwhelm other vegetation, can block light, destabilize slopes, and create unsuitable wildlife habitat. Finally, invasive species can increase their population rapidly. So there's a photograph of a Euro European green crab right now, currently on the top 10 most wanted list of invasive species. Um, once they're established, they're nearly impossible to eliminate and they can increase their population extremely rapidly. So it's important to remember that invasive species can have a negative impact on the environment, the economy, and our society. They can spread disease, introduce parasites, disrupt food chains and compete with native species for resources, including rare and endangered species. Every year, invasives cost BC millions of dollars. So now that we know that invasives can damage ecosystems and reduce biodiversity, that means that we probably have a lot at stake in BC. So let's take a look at what we have to lose and what it makes and what it is that makes BC so special and draws millions of tourists to visit here every year. So BC has a unique location and a mountainous nature. There are not too many places like it in the world. A few factors stand out though. So BC has a mind blowing variety of natural landscapes and wild spaces. From some of the world's last remaining temperate rainforests to the alpine environments of the Canadian Rockies and the coast mountains. BC has some of the world's most iconic species and has incredible biodiversity, some of the highest in the entire country. Both of these two factors contribute to the endless opportunities for adventure in the province. Wilderness tourism is the main driver of all tourism in BC. So we can look at those in a little bit more detail. Pretty simple, BC is just huge. It's about 1200 kilometers north-south and 1000 kilometers east-west, which makes it the size of many different European countries combined. So it has a complex landscape, includes a varied topography and a physiography, which includes many microclimates and both terrestrial and marine ecosystems. You can see on the tiny little inset map there, that's a map of the protected areas in BC. So BC has more protected areas than anywhere else in Canada. About 14% of the province is protected as parks or conservation areas or ecological reserves. BC also has a unique topography and location. So about 75% of the province is covered by mountains and there are over 40,000 islands throughout BC. 
Marine and terrestrial ecosystems often are interacting to create unique and vibrant coastal zones. So as you can see on that larger map there, BC has many different biogeoclimatic zones, and these are heavily influenced by the mountainous landscape of the province. These mountain ranges can create rain shadows and dramatic temperature differences over very short horizontal differences leading to many different microclimates. So a little bit confusing. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm just reading one of the questions there to make the window larger. I don't know if that's on me. Pardon me, I'll continue. Um, so basically BC has it all. Um, it's <clears throat> got everything. And when we're looking at our biodiversity, we can uh, talk about how these unique land and climate systems make BC home to some of the richest wildlife resources in North America. So BC has the greatest biodiversity of any province in Canada. About 95 million hectares in size, and that's only about 10% of the size of Canada, yet it's home to three quarters of Canada's bird and mammal species. There are over 1,100 native species of vertebrates, including almost 500 species of bird, hundreds of species of fish, hundreds of mammals, and 36 species of reptile and amphibian. New species are also recorded in the province regularly. BC is home to almost 35,000 species of insect and between 50 to 70,000 invertebrates. Pretty crazy number. BC is also home to many endemic species. So an endemic species is a species that is not known to occur anywhere else in the world. 24 species of mammal are only found in BC. I bet if you think hard, you can probably think of end an endemic species that lives near you, as well as hundreds of insects and plant species are only found in BC. As well, a lot of the birds that we have here breed nowhere else in Canada. <clears throat> Excuse me. BC also has the highest number of species at risk. So there are more than 1,800 species in the province at risk, and these species are highly susceptible to ecosystem structure change through invasive species. And these are often iconic species like the caribou that could easily vanish from the province. All right, so both those factors, so many landscapes, such a large amount of life, wildlife, that means BC has pretty much an endless opportunity for recreation and different outdoor experiences. Wilderness and adventure tourism is the main driver of all tourism in BC. People are coming here to experience the remote, wild, and raw beauty of BC. From sea kayaking and whitewater rafting to remote luxury wilderness lodges and small family-run hunting outfits. These are the very core of tourism in BC and they support many other assets, facets of the tourism industry. BC also has an impressive range of incredible recreation activities. There are very few places in the world where you can ski, hike, photograph wolves or bears, go climbing, go golfing, go to a winery or go river rafting, often all on the same vacation. BC has some of the highest mountains in North America, thousands of freshwater lakes and rivers and thousands of different activities to choose from. Another unique experience that draws visitors to BC is the opportunity for cultural explore, exploration and learning. With 203 indigenous communities and more than 30 indigenous languages spoken, BC has one of the most diverse assembly of living indigenous cultures on earth. Visitors, visitors can connect with the people and languages that have passed the stories of indigenous BC for thousands upon thousands of years. With so much to do and see in BC, Tourism has become a massive business. At the core of BC's tourism is the essence wild at heart. This speaks to the truth about tourists to BC. They have a deep appreciation of nature and crave a connection to the wild, as I think most of us that live in BC do as well. BC is a top tourist destination for travelers worldwide and biodiversity, wild spaces and healthy ecosystems are key to attracting travelers. In 2017, there were more than 19,000 tourism related organizations operating in the province and tourism and the tourism industry was ranked as the most important sector to BC's economy. The indus industry generates 17 billion annually in revenue with wilderness tourism bringing in more than 2 billion. Tourism will continue to see rapid growth. The industry supports 132,000 direct jobs and by 2028, it is estimated that 106,000 jobs in a wide range of professions will be added. Wilderness tourism alone generates 26,000 high value full-time jobs. As wild places and animals disappear around the world, international and resident travelers are flocking to BC. 
By 2030, international tourist arrivals are expected to reach 1.8 billion internationally, and eco and nature-based tourism are expected to continue to grow. When considering strategies to stop invasive species, we must also note that over half, about 53% of the province's 21.6 million overnight visitors in 2017 were BC residents. And it's also important to note that these resident travelers have just as much, if not more capacity in some cases to spread invasive species around the province. So yeah, I think it's pretty clear that we have a lot to lose in BC. But unfortunately for us, invasive species are already here and they're causing a lot of damage in, in BC. <clears throat> so this guy here, some of you might be familiar with, this is a smallmouth bass which is a becoming more frequent problem in the province. They're spreading into BC, primarily due to intentional introductions for sport fishing. So a lot of the invasives that we have in the province are already negatively impacting the tourism industry. And we'll see that some of the invasives have actually arrived here as a result of the tourism industry. So the first one we're gonna look at, this is a, a perfect example of how tourism can actually end up spreading invasive species. So this is carpet burrweed. We're gonna go through a, a few invasive species here. Some of them you may be familiar with, um, some of them you might not be. So this first species, carpet burrweed, is an example of how tourism can spread invasives. So carpet burrweed is an invasive winter annual that threatens open areas in parks, golf courses, RV parks, exposed grasslands, pastures, basically anywhere that has recently disturbed soil. It can easily outcompete native species as it grows in dense mats that prevent the growth of native grasses. It has competitive advantages in that it flowers and seeds very early in the spring, and when it dies off in the summer, it leaves a bare patch of soil, allowing germination of its own seeds. Carpet burrweed has super sharp, speed, super sharp seeds that can cause a hazard to pets and children, but most importantly, these are one of the main ways that the, the plant spreads. So the barbs puncture the skin of humans or animals or get caught in clothing, on footwear, in animal fur, or on camping equipment. And that's how one of the main reasons it's spread to other areas. So this is a pretty common tactic for invasive species to use. So other species like burdock also employ this strategy where they cling to your clothing and you can unwillingly transport invasive species. So a, a cautionary story was shared with us by BC Parks, which some of you might already be familiar with and it has to do with that photograph there. So that's a photo from Ruckle Park on Salt Spring Island and carpet burrweed was first established in the park there in 1997. And it likely entered the park on someone's camping equipment. Since then, ongoing efforts to eradicate it have failed and it's resulted in many campsite closures and more than $25,000 spent annually some years. The plant is now present on Southern Vancouver Island and spread around the Gulf Islands. So it's likely hitching rides on camping equipment and vehicles as people do trips in that area. It's difficult to remove, as you can see in the photo, it requires expensive gear, training and safety equipment to properly manage. So carpet bur burry is a great example of how tourism activities can unknowingly spread invasive species. So this is another invasive that uh, some folks, especially if you're from the interior of the province or you spend a lot of time around freshwater might be familiar, familiar with. This is Eurasian water milfoil. And this is one of the most widespread aquatic invasives on the planet. And we'll take a look at how Eurasian water milfoil is impacting recreation opportunities now. So it was established in the early 1970s in the Okanagan and since then has spread across BC. There are, however, still many uninfested water bodies in the area and elsewhere that remain susceptible. So we need to be very vigilant with our monitoring. <clears throat> this plant spreads easily as tiny plant pieces develop into new plants. Boats, trailers, fishing and swimming gear, and just simply water currents can spread the plant. So once it's established in a watershed, it's incredibly difficult to remove. As you can see in the photo there, Water milfoil grows in very thick, dense mats that block sunlight, slow water, shade out other plants and alter the chemistry of the water system. So these mats also detract from the aesthetic appeal of the shoreline and dense stands result in stagnant waters which increase breeding grounds for mosquitoes and decaying plants can reduce the oxygen levels in the lake and lead to die-offs of native species and fish. Important for recreation though, is that these mats 
can be extremely dangerous. So they can limit recreation such as boating, swimming, and fishing. And beaches and docks are often closed. There have been many, many accounts of people actually drowning in water milfoil. So every year, water milfoil costs operators millions and millions of dollars in management, and it has changed the way we recreate in freshwater in some parts of our province. All right, we're gonna look at a final species here. This is quagga and zebra mussels. So you may be familiar with this one, but hopefully you're not actually familiar with them yet because this species has yet to arrive in the province. And we're gonna, we're trying very hard to keep it that way. So quagga and zebra mussels are a high alert species in BC. They've invaded the Great Lakes system and spread across North America from there, but they've yet to establish in the neighboring provinces or states. So quagga and zebra mussels are filter feeders. Just like most mussels, they consume massive amounts of phytoplankton and zooplankton that form the base of the aquatic food web, and they can alter the water chemistry and the quality of the water. Hundreds of thousands of individuals can accumulate per square meter. It's really quite insane. So they accumulate on docks, on boats, on buoys, on beaches, and <clears throat> Pardon me. And they've made a lot of lake systems in Eastern Canada nearly unusable for recreational activities. So mussels have a high financial, financial cost as they can clog pipes, water intake systems, municipal water supplies, and underwater infrastructure, and they require constant removal. The mussels are spread similar to other invasive species by attaching to surfaces like boats and other recreational equipment. This is why it's important very important to always make sure we clean, drain, and dry our equipment. So that was just the impacts from three different species. In addition to these and other terrestrial species, there are approximately 133 different aquatic invasive species in the province, many of which continue to spread and cause serious damage. We're gonna take a look at how invasives impact tourism and the direct impacts that they have. So this is a, a photograph from Eastern Canada. This is quagga and zebra mussels that have taken over a beach and made it completely unusable. All right, so if you remember from our definition of invasives, we need to remember that invasives cause harm to the environment, the economy and our society. So we'll go into a little bit more detail in each of those. So one of the main impacts invasive species can have on the environment is a reduction in biodiversity. This is a loss of the very critters and habitats that make BC such an attractive destination. Invasives can accomplish this in a variety of ways. So invasive species are often general, generalist predators and can be very detrimental to BC's native species. So this is an American bullfrog pictured here and generalist predator basically means that they'll consume anything. So as well, invasive species can outcompete local plants for resources and quickly overwhelm native ecosystems. Some invasives like knotweed are among the fastest growing plants in the entire world. It's quite hard for our little local native grasses to compete with. Many invasive species can transmit diseases and pathogens or even interbreed with closely related species, reducing the overall biodiversity. If you can recall from one of the earlier slides, we picture the red-eared slider turtle and, and we mentioned how they're very commonly spreading diseases to our native, native turtle species. So invasive species are also ecosystem engineers, and that means that they can physically and physically alter the chemical or physical structure of an ecosystem. So many aquatic invasive weeds can grow so densely that swimming or operating a watercraft is impossible, like we saw with the Eurasian water milfoil, where other invasives have roots that can leach toxic chemicals and erode riverbanks and overwhelm riparian areas, such as we can see the knotweed doing in this photo here. So economic impacts. Pretty simple is invasive species cost a lot of money and prevention is always, always more economical than management. So when we kind of break that down, we can see that invasives are gonna require additional time, additional staff, training and equipment. Uh, additionally, as, as well, a lot of safety training is required to manage invasives. Um, invasives can cause burns and stings, or as we saw, can sometimes require equipment like propane torches to remove them. So invasives like Himalayan balsam in the second photo there can also grow through buildings, destroy road and trail infrastructure and create unsightly properties. So it's pretty difficult to attract tourists or to want to visit an area when it's completely overrun with weeds. 
the loss of biodiversity and habitats due to invasive species leads to a loss of wildlife and the iconic images that tourists are coming to expect when they visit BC are simply vanishing. So it's pretty hard to go bear watching or whale watching or fishing uh, when there's no bears or whales or fish around. So invasive species also have some pretty severe social impacts. So health and safety is always a priority and invasive species like fire ants, for example, or Himalayan blackberry can cause stings, pricks and cuts. So pretty minor things, but other species like giant hogweed, for example, have nasty chemicals in their sap, which can cause serious burns to your skin and require medical attention. So that photo there is a pretty nasty uh, burn from some giant hogweed sap. Invasives like Canada thistle that we saw an example of earlier can lower the air quality and invasives like quagga and zebra mussels we know can affect the water quality as well. And we also noted how other invasives can even lead to fatalities. So some pretty severe impacts to health and safety there. Invasives also impact First Nations cultures. So invasives compete with native species that First Nations use as traditional foods, medicines, and in spiritual practices. A lot of these species are the same species <laughs> that tourism operators rely on to attract people, people to BC every year as they are iconic species. Invasives also change the way that we recreate. So they reduce access to spaces like beaches, trails, shorelines, and they damage our recreational equipment like boats and bicycles. Another common invasive is known as puncture vine, and it has the ability to puncture bicycle tires and destroy your recreational equipment. Basically, invasives make access to the wilderness more, wilderness more difficult and more expensive. So that was a lot of impacts and we need to make sure that we keep invasives out and properly management, manage them. Unfortunately, <clears throat> tourism is now being considered as one of the major pathways in the spread of invasive species. So this is a great example here. Um, these seeds have clung to someone's hiking boots and it's a great, great way that invasives spread very easily. So we're gonna look at how tourism acts as a pathway a little bit more here. So tourism is now becoming a major pathway, like I said, and a pathway is just any means that allows the entry or spread of an invasive species. So tourism often involves people moving from region to region and transporting different species. Tourism activities, on the other hand, and the, requir the required equipment like boats, bikes, hiking boots are the vectors that spread invasive species. So a vector is any living or non-living carrier that transports living organisms intentionally or unintentionally. So to make it a little bit easier, we can think of as tourism related, sorry, we can think of the tourism industry as the road and the other activities as the vehicles on the road. So just like in real life, some of those vehicles stop to pick up hitchhikers and some are covered in mud and dirt. These hitchhikers and mud are the invasive species. So tourism related activities that we know introduce and spread invasives include fishing, recreational boating, passenger ships, float plane trips, scuba diving, hiking, camping, and mountain biking. Tourism can also be particularly important when cons considering the spread of invasives as many tourism businesses operate in remote, pristine and wild areas. These are often ecologically sensitive areas like national parks, wetlands or estuaries and operators tend to interact with species at risk. Aquatic invasive species are of particular concern as once established in a freshwater or marine ecosystem, invasive plants and animals are almost impossible to get rid of and their impacts are far reaching and long lasting. Recreational boaters also move freely within the province and can easily transport invasives between watersheds. So that was all a little bit scary, or it was to me at least, but hopefully there's some things we can do about it. So we're gonna look at some of the actions we can take today and hopefully we can commit to taking some steps to prevent the introduction and spread of invasives in BC. So ISCBC is currently working on a list of comprehensive audience specific best management practices, but that doesn't mean there's not a lot that we can do right now. So first off, there are simple steps that we can take before, during and after each activity to stop the spread of invasives. Let's take a little bit of a closer look here. So before your experience, if you're a tourism operator and you have access to your clients before they arrive, make sure you send them some information. So any invasives in, in their area or in your area, what, what they do when they see them and what they are. 
if you're a visitor or a guest and you're going to a new region, you can do this research on your own, do a little pre-trip planning and see if there's any invasive species in the area you should be aware of. Before participating in any activity on the water, make sure you follow these simple steps. So they're laid out there on the screen. On the screen, clean all plants, animals, and mud from your boots, gear, pets, and vehicles. Ensure anything you have is removed, is disposed of on land. Do a visual inspection of your watercraft and gear to make sure everything is removed. Drain all the water from your boat and gear onto land. So this includes all internal compartments, anything you can think of, ballast tanks, live wells, bilges, make sure it's all drained out. Pull all the plugs. So a lot of states and provinces in Canada is actually illegal to transport watercraft with um, plugs in. Dry all parts of your boat and gear completely. So make sure no water is left standing, use a towel or a sponge to reach hard areas. Now you're ready to get your boat in the water. If your activity doesn't involve going out on the water, instead take these steps. So remove plants, animals, and mud from your boots, gear, pets, and vehicles. Clean your gear before entering and leaving the site. Make sure you plan to stay on des designated trails and roads. Cutting across trails and roads into wilderness can often spread invasive species unintentionally. And check to make sure you are using only local firewood or hay if you're planning to have a fire. So you might notice that a lot of these steps are, are pretty simple and we've actually drawn a lot of them from our other programming. And that's because they've proven to be highly effective and we're not trying to reinvent the wheel here. We're trying to raise awareness and create effective solutions. All right. So now that we've done that, we can get going. Remember when we're out with guests or if we're out on an activity in our own, on our own, enjoying the wilderness, there's a lot of stuff that we can do as we're participating in that activity to prevent the spread of invasives. First things first is double check. So double check yourself and your guests, make sure you're not a vector for invasive species. So this means check yourself, your gear, throughout to make sure you're not unknowingly transporting any invasive species like those seeds that we saw in those hiking boots earlier. Secondly, and this is one of the most important things we can all do, is to report. So you are the eyes and ears on the ground and you are the first line of defense. So record any invasive species that you see in any way that you can. Tourism operators in particular, I know myself included, are often returning to same sites continually. So we know these areas very well, and if we spot something new or different, reporting it can make a huge difference to detect an early introduction and get the invasive species under control. So record any way you can, but to make things easier, go ahead and download the Report Invasives BC app. So this is the user interface you can see on the right side of the screen there. When you open the app, you can easily report invasives. You can find the plant or animal, confirm with some of the photos provided, report it and take a photo of the species. If you don't have data, you can report later when you get back to the office or home and it will record the exact location you were when you took the photo. It is important to report all sightings so that we can collect important information about where invasive species are and then move on to management and control. But if you're like me, you might not like using your phone. So there are still other ways to report. I encourage you to go to bcinvasives.ca forward slash report. The URL is right there on the screen and you can learn about some other ways to report which include contacting your regional invasive species organization or some government contacts that you can also call up. It's just important to remember any way you can re report and record invasives is extremely important. All right, so what happens after? We've gotten back from our horseback ride or we've just finished jet skiing and, and we're ready to go home. First things first, before anyone takes off, remember to remind yourself or your guests that we can all be vectors of invasive species and we can all take action to reduce their spread. So hopefully you leave with an unforgettable experience as well as some new tricks on how to learn on how to be invasive wise. All right, so we've seen this one before, but we're gonna repeat it again because it's incredibly important and a really simple step to take clean, drain, and dry. Make sure you and your equipment are clean of invasive species after every activity. So this is also a great way for you to take care of your gear. Um, I don't know about other people, but for myself, I get a guide discount. It only goes so far with gear. So if you're like me, after every activity, I'm trying to extend the life of my gear as much as I can. Last, remember that managing invasives is an ongoing effort and requires constant work, time, and money once they're established. 
So as we talked about earlier, prevention is always the best, best means to, sorry, most economic means. It's also important to think about invasive species in a larger context. So when thinking about healthy natural eco ecosystems, invasives are only one part of a much more complex problem. As operators, staff, clients, or residents of BC, we should all be stewards of our local regions. Removing garbage, cleaning campsites, and volunteering are great ways to do this. So we've had a chat about some of the steps to take um, to prevent invasives, but there's always more to be done. So I just wanted to highlight a few organizations around the province here um, that are going a little bit above and beyond with their commitment to preventing in invasive species. This is by no means uh, inclusive of all the, the organizations in the province. There are very, very many uh, organizations that are doing their part. So in 2019, the new Denver Marina, you can see on the left side of the, the photo there, they're managed by the Slocan Lake Boating Association. They became the first invasive wise marina in the central Kootenai region. So they've committed to being invasive wise and encouraging boaters to clean, drain, and dry their equipment. They also participate in boat inspections and actively work to manually remove terrestrial invasives like knapweed. The marina also amended their moorage agreement to include invasive species specific clauses. There's two other companies here. Um, the first is Chilcotin Holidays which is a na nature-based tourism operator. And then they're taking a progressive approach to invasive species management. They work to encourage all res resource users to be stewards of the land and to ensure that wildlife comes first. They survey wildlife populations, monitor native species and have protocols for managing invasives. They approach invasive species management in the perspective of the bigger picture, healthy and natural landscapes and sustainable environments. Another great example, is Eagle Wings Tours, which is a locally owned and operated wildlife and whale watching company based out of Victoria. They donate their time and money to prevent invasive species, including the use of their boats for terrestrial, terrestrial weed pools on the remote islands, as well as using their expertise in scuba diving to monitor and record marine invasive species. Eagle Wing also runs a youth education program to raise awareness and to get kids interested in science. They're keen to incorporate invasive species into their programming. So I've had some great talks with Chilcotin Holidays and Eagle Wing Tours, and they're two companies who are committed to protecting BC's biodiversity and working with us to build invasive-wise practices into their client protocols and work. If you are an owner or operator watching right now, please contact me after the webinar to see how you can be involved in piloting the program. All right, so an invasive-wise province. Becoming an invasive-wise tourism organization or an invasive-wise travel traveler will hopefully be the new normal in the future. Businesses will have access to a collection of resources aimed at owners, operators, and guests, which will include a package of resources like fact sheets or practical best management practices to implement. One of the main aspects of becoming invasive-wise will be completing the online training course. This course is an e-learning interactive course designed with and for tourism operators for staff. It emphasizes the connections between tourism and invasive species and details the actions to take to prevent the spread. The course will be hosted on the new ISCBC website, which is launching in a few days. A main difference between the Invasive Wise Tourism Program and some of our other, other behavior change programs that we mentioned before, like Clean Drain Dry or Play Clean Go, is that this one comes with a recognition program and an Invasive Wise certification. So this will be a great way to promote your business especially in a time when most tourism businesses have sustainability plans or leave no trace plans and Inva being invasive wise will really serve to set you apart. All right, so we talked about quite a lot today. Um, there are a few key takeaways that hopefully we're all gonna leave with though. First, we learned that invasive species have a direct and devastating impact on the tourism industry and they can affect all aspects of life in BC impacting our environment, our culture and our society. We also talked about how tourism is now being recognized as a major pathway in the spread of invasive species. So this is often in the form of unwanted hitchhikers that hitch a free ride, free ride on our gear, on our clothing, and can be transported between different bodies of water or different ecosystems. Finally, we learned there are some simple actions that we can take now to stop the spread. So we need to remember that every time we go out on an adventure or have an experience, we have the power to make a difference and protect the biodiversity of our province. So we can take action on invasives right now, regardless of if we're tourism operators, guides, or just out enjoying 
feces wilderness. So I'm sure, or I hope you remember, we narrow those down um, into a few key actions that we can take before, during, and after each activity. So before, I'll just repeat it again. We're gonna clean, drain, and dry our boats and gears, our boat and gear. So during your ex experience, make sure you're constantly checking yourself for invasive species or unwanted hitchhikers. And if you see any evasives, make sure you record them and report them. After your trip, make sure you and your equipment are clean and remember that we can all be potential vectors and we need to work together to prevent the spread. Finally, remember that reporting is one of the single most important things that we can do. So download the app, I put it up on the screen again there, or please go to bcinvasives.ca forward slash report to learn more. Together we can stop, together we can take action to stop the spread of invasives and keep BC healthy and natural and one of the most stunning places to live and play on the planet. I would just like to give a quick thank you to our sponsors. Without them, the project would not be possible. So the project is primarily funded through the Canada Nature Fund for Aquatic Species at Risk. And like I mentioned, we have a diverse group of industry professionals and experts providing input and feedback on the project. All right, I would now, uh, I would just like to thank everyone for participating in the webinar today and now is the time to take action. So just wanna leave you as a reminder to create a plan for your business or for your next outdoor activity. How will your actions reduce the spread of invasive species? All right, we'll leave it open uh, for a few questions there. I think we have about 10 or 15 minutes. Thank you very much, everyone. Hey, thank you, Anthony. Thanks for that great presentation. And thank you as well for your great enthusiasm um, and energy around this topic. It's great to uh, great to have you speaking on it. Thank you, Sue. So I see a few folks are um, have, have used the Q&A box. So if you take a look on the bottom of your screen, the Q&A box is where you need to stick your questions in, not the chat. Um, and we'll go through the questions one by one. Again, if your question's already in there, you can give, give it a thumbs up and it gets shoved to the top of the list. I'll go through the, the, those lists, uh, the, the list right now. And um, hopefully we'll work, we'll get through all the questions as time allows. So the first question is, how can we allow invasive plants to be sold in gardening stores and nurseries? Has the government ever considered passing a law to ban the sales of these species? So good question. Anthony, do you wanna take a track at that or do you want me to take a crack at that? Definitely, I'll, I'll let uh, Sue speak in if, if she has some more information. Um, so I've been with the council for about two months now and I haven't worked exactly uh, on kind of the horticulture side of things, but I know there's some programming in place to work with gardeners and horticulturists around the province to kind of um, choose different local species to replace invasive species. So that's a lot of our plant-wise programming um, right now is aimed at that. Sue, do you have uh, maybe a little bit more comprehensive answer there? No, that's great. And, and right on to, to um, address plant-wise. Um, the, the government definitely has a, a list of plants. I don't know, many of you might be familiar. Oh, I don't think you can see it with my uh, crazy screen. This is the guide to noxious weeds and other selected invasive plants in BC. You can download it from our website. The, this list is a, a list that talks about plants that are not, you know, that you as a landowner, as a land manager have to treat on your property. So the, the challenge with it is keeping up with um, updating the list, you know, as, as we go forward. Uh, this this uh, last printing, I think, was 2017, so there needs to be an update to it, and that's something that the provincial government works hard on to, uh, to work with the horticultural industry and land managers to, uh, to figure that out. So good question. Thank you. All right. Um, I'm just checking. Uh, let's see where we are. So Aaron, a question from Aaron. Thank you, Anthony. I noticed that Thompson Okanagan Tourism Association was noted in your final slide. Are they actively sharing invasive species prevention information with their member businesses? That's a good question. I, so I believe um, that they are actively sharing information. Um, we're also, like I noted, so the Invasive Wise Tourism Program itself is kind of just starting to get kicked off. So I know more information will be shared in the coming months with the the business is associated with all our regional invasive councils. Um, Sue, anything you have there? 
No, that's great. Yeah, and you're exactly right. They, this is the, we're at the very beginning of this program, uh, and they've been a huge supporter for us as an as an advisor to the program to make sure we're you know we ha we're using the right language and we're speaking to tourism operators um, in a relevant and accessible way. All right, another a question from Augustina. How many tourist operators are now part of the Tourism Wise program? Great question. <laughs> yeah. Right so, now, oh, go ahead, Anthony. Yeah. So, kind of like CUSA, we're still in the in the really early stages. So, I've had a, a few really good conversations um, with some organizations and signed up a few businesses to pilot the program this spring. Um, like I mentioned earlier on in the slide, we're hoping for about twenty different organiza organizations. So, please feel free to to reach out to myself. Um, the emails up on the slide, I can throw it back up uh, if anyone needs my contact, but please feel free to reach out if you're interested in being involved. Yeah, that would be great. We would love to uh, to have you as part of this program. As Anthony said, we're piloting this year, uh, launching it this spring with a great uh, online course and a nice package of resources. So if you are a tourism operator or work for one, please uh, get in touch with Anthony. All right, a question about iNaturalist from Stefan. Do you use iNaturalist records to identify invasives? So I, I threw the iNaturalist logo up there um, just because I wanted people to be aware that there are other ways to report invasives. And, and the main, the main, the important thing we want to focus on is that we are reporting and recording. Um, it's obviously a lot easier if we're all kind of using the same app, which is why I encourage you to use the Report BC Invasives app. But I know a lot of people are more familiar with some of the other apps like iNaturalist. So yes, um, we do use the iNaturalist records um, to identify invasive species. All right. Great. Thanks for that. Thanks for that question. One from Stephanie. I think about trying to encourage engagement with biosecurity. Can you expand a little on any or any of the facilities available to people to be able to clean their equipment after use? It's a very good question. Of course, aside from their cleaning it at home, perhaps more relevant if you're going directly from one site to another. It's, it's a great point, Stephanie, you know, especially with uh, more remote sites. Yeah, that is a, a great question. So, um, sorry, I'm, I'm just reading the question. So a, a, a large part of the Invasive Tourism Program is providing those resources to operators, especially in remote areas. So those can be as simple as, as and very highly effective, like boot brushes at trailheads have proven to be very effective at removing invasive species from, from trails or remote areas. Um, <clears throat> Sue, do you uh, have anything to input there for kind of the clean, drain, and dry program? Yeah, that, you know, that's one thing that so many, um, uh, you know, marinas and uh, more remote lake uh, based organizations have asked for some kind of a, a facility to actually clean your boat off when you're, when they are being pulled out of a lake. And that's something, of course, it takes, that takes funding and um, resources and, and equipment. Um, but that's something that, you know, we're, we're really hoping, particularly with some of the invasive wise marinas, the folks that have signed on to be that, uh, to, to that program, that they were, are trying to build that into their, um, uh, you know, to their facility. All right. Thanks for that qu question. Um, from a question from Laura, is I, ISCBC working with the province to update the weed control regulation list of invasive species? <laughs> the little so, green book. <laughs> yeah, so Laura, I don't actually know exactly the answer to that question. I believe it is yes. Is that correct, Sue? Um, yeah, that's right. That's yeah. right. And as well, the, the the regional invasive species committees that are around the province are also really important partners there because they're the experts on the ground. They know what's around their areas. They know what's being sold uh, by the horticultural industry. So they're really key, key partners as well. All right, question from Linda. Are there any citizen science projects that tap into tourists for invasive research or management as part of their experience? Cool idea. That is a great idea. Um, I don't know of any off the top of my head. Um, I know that right now there's a lot of funding coming down the line um, to engage more citizen science projects, as, particularly around European green crab, hoping to raise awareness around uh, citizens and kind of resident travelers alike. I'm not sure anything specific to, to tourists though. Um, so I, I know we've had some discussion amongst our staff that hopefully we can expand the, the tourism project to start focusing on, on travelers and visitors. Whereas right now we're focusing more on the operator end 
yeah, do you have any any input there, Sue? No, but I, it's something that, you know, we would like to build into our program as well as, you know, yeah. if operators are keen on that, both for their their staff as well as their clients, that's something that we can we can definitely support with. So so great idea. All right. Uh, another note, I'm just scrolling through, making sure I'm not missing any. Um, another qu question from Aaron, just a comment re regarding the spread of aquatic invasive species promoting watercraft inspection carried out by the BC Conservation Officer Service on our borders between, you know, Alberta and uh, the states for travelers coming to BC from outside is an important step to complement clean, drain, dry. Thanks for that that's reminder, right Aaron. <clears throat> yeah, that's so true. And people, you, many of you have probably seen uh, or hopefully have seen those boat inspection stations in the spring uh, right into October that, uh, that, that are run provincially. All right, anonymous attendee, is the reason for aquatic mitigation being the initial focus of the program due to water-based tourism in BC being a larger industry or are aquatic invasive species just more prone to spreading? Very good question. So a lot of the initial focus um, was also due to our funding, which is initially from the Canada Nature Fund for aquatic species at risk. Um, but it is true that aquatic species are spread often a lot easier and, and the impacts can be a lot more challenging to deal with once they're established in a watershed. So right now we have a lot of those high alert species that we, we talked about. So the clog and zebra mussels and, and the water milfoil and, the, and these species can just be spread a lot easier than some terrestrial species. So I think that's why our main focus started as aquatic. Yeah, and Aaron, as you well know too, that once they get into an aquatic system, it's almost impossible to get rid of them. So we felt it was a great, a great place to start. Question from Jackie. Hey, Jackie, what's the criteria that will be used to choose the companies to be involved in this program? That's a great question. So right now, uh, especially with COVID, it's kind of a, a tricky time for a lot of tourism operators. So um, we, we don't have a specific set of criteria right now. We're just looking for operators that are already kind of aware of invasives that are aware of sustainability practices that are operating in remote areas or sensitive areas and that really have the, the time and resources to be signing up for a new program right now. So the pilot program will be a, a free cost to everyone and it'll involve a whole bunch of resources, but a lot of operators right now are kind of operating on a, a skeletal crew. So if you're keen to, if you're an operation keen to sign up, like I said, please, uh, please be in contact and we can talk further about the next steps. Great. Yeah, thanks for that. Yeah, it's a tough time for the tourism industry, as you folks well know. Um, so we're really delighted that uh, that so many folks are keen on working with us. All right. Um, where are we here? I think, are we almost done? Um, I see a question okay, about more. COVID. Um, uh -huh. <laughs> just with the spread of invasives there. Sorry, Sue. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, so uh, the question is, has there been any changes seen in the spread of invasives with the change of tourism due to COVID-19? Um, that is a great question. And I have not actually seen any um, scientific data to support an answer, but I would um, off the top of my head suggest that perhaps, but I'm, I'm really not sure. Um, you yeah. also have to consider that with COVID, we have a lot more resident travelers moving around the province, um, people that might not have vis visited areas in the province before taking their boats there. So it could have also had an opposite effect where we're actually seeing invasives that are already mm -hmm. present in BC spreading a little bit faster. Yeah, yeah, good point, Anthony, it's so true. We, we're still lots of us moving around in BC, but uh, less, less uh, folks from the states and other provinces, so, all right. Kim McRae, I've seen boot cleaning stations at entrances to some parks in different countries where there is a concern about invasives coming in. Do you know if any of these exist in BC and if not, how to encourage park operators to get them installed? It also helps spread awareness to visitors that may not necessarily read signs because they see the strange piece of equipment and become curious. Yeah, so true, Kim. Do you want to yeah, speak to that one, Anthony? Yeah, that's definitely a, a great question, great comment. Um, I don't know exactly in BC specific locations, but I, I know even in my personal travels, I've seen boot brushes at many different trailheads, um, particularly areas like Gulf Islands or, or areas that are ecologically sensitive. Um, and, and Kim's exactly right there. I've read many articles that are very effective, um, simple tool. And, and like she said, people are often 
a little bit confused by them and kind of raises a little bit more awareness. Um, kind of goes back to what Sue was talking about though, just with kind of installing infra infrastructure for Clean Jane Dry and those other programs. It takes a lot of funding and kind of hands on the ground. So it's a little bit, uh, a little bit of a slow, tricky process to kind of install those everywhere they're actually needed. No, yeah, and, and very true. And just to just to add a, a point to that, we're very uh, big close partners with BC Parks. They have installed um, some uh, trailhead boot brushes, which are great, and that's something that we're looking um, to expand through this Invasive Wise Tourism program. So, great question. Anna, what about pushing tourism to pu push for the harvest of invasive species for consumption, like green crab? <laughs> that is a, is a great idea. And I know uh, I can't speak to uh, green crab in particular. I know other countries like New Zealand have, have really embraced that. So I know hunting in New Zealand is, is pretty much open game for most mammal species as all mammals in New Zealand are considered invasive. So I know other, uh, other regions and other countries are looking at, as, at that as a possible solution. So that's a great idea. Yeah, thanks for that. And and uh, part of this part of the citizen science, citizen science aspect of this program is going to be um, offering some tools and resources to folks that are out and about in the tourism industry, whether you're tour your you know the clients or operators, to actually identify green crab and report. Um, so that, you know, great to have those eyes on the ground. All right, we're just at almost at one o'clock. I think we have time for one more question from Jules. Now that we're rebuilding our industry due to COVID traveling, it'd be a good time to include this with any new funding that, for example, TOTA, the Thompson Okanagan Tourist Association grants to show how funding will be used to help with keeping our biodiversity clean. Yeah, great, great point. Great comment. Thank you, Jules. Yeah, and, uh, you know, I thinking what we're hoping is that you know, the, the folks that have been supporting us through this program the, in the industry, hopefully it'll give them a bit of a leg up to say, actually, now we are a sustainable tourism organization, but we're also invasive wise. So we've adopted this program and hopefully that will be a, a supportive or a helpful piece for them to, you know, potentially get more interest from clients. Definitely. All right. Well, hey, well, good timing. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, everyone, for attending the webinar. And thank you, Sue, for leading the questions and the introduction there. Hey, well, thank you, Anthony. That was a great, uh, great presentation on behalf of the ISCBC and everybody listening. Thanks again for that, uh, for that presentation and for sharing your expertise with us today. We're going to be emailing you all out a short survey. We would love it if you completed it. It gives us some great feedback on this webinar and also my, some ideas for future webinars. And we also invite you to join us at our forum. Invasives 2021 is happening February 9th to 11. We usually obviously have it in person. Now we are virtual. And we've got some fabulous speakers, including someone from New Zealand, um, people from three continents covering really exciting topics, including goldfish, uh, combating invasive species using molecular and genetic technologies, and a great presentation around reaching audiences in a time of information overload. So check out the agenda and register today. Uh, Brittany, our great tech support person is popping it in the chat window. Um, if you enjoy this webinar, consider supporting ISCBC's work by joining us as a member. You get discount on paid events and training courses among other things. So check that out on our website as well. And just a last point, if you live in BC and wanna make an impact in your community and are between the ages of 15 to 30, we have a great volunteer program. You can check that out at, uh, on our website under Get Involved Volunteers, and uh, we would love to have you with us. Anyone, anyway, folks, um, thanks again for your time and, and energy today. It's great to see so many of you joining, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much. Thanks again. See you next time.